Well, I'm delighted to be here and have a chance to participate in the celebration of Jim and Asta's uh, amazing careers. I'd especially like to thank them for uh, creating a really positive and productive <coughs> environment at the University of Utah where we were encouraged to uh, think big. And, uh, and I had a, a terrific group of uh, in our cohort to uh, interact with at that time. And so what I would like to talk about today uh, is uh, genetics-based uh, restoration and uh, ecosystem engineering. And I've kind of chosen these inflammatory words uh, because you know, ecologists really negatively respond to engineering or ecosystem engineering in the sense that uh, the Army Corps of Engineers has created some absolutely wonderful examples of what not to do uh, and incredible disasters. Uh, but I think it's really important that we learn how to do this because uh, we are really uh, creating havoc throughout uh, our planet and we are going to be called increasingly upon to uh, do exactly this where we're going to have to go into areas that have been destroyed or severely damaged and try to get something back or hopefully a lot. And so I would argue we really need to learn how to do this uh, and we better start now. So, so basically genetic based restoration is really focused on how do we save the most in a worst case scenario? Because there's a lot of worst case scenarios. And today I'd emphasize two approaches uh, that, that go together. Number one, we focus on the foundation species. So these can be include keystone, dominant ecosystem engineers uh, for each ecosystem. And these are especially important because by definition they are the drivers of their respective systems. And so if we lose these species, uh, we're going to lose a lot more uh, because they support virtually everything else, or a lot of it. And the second thing I want to emphasize is that we really need to utilize the extensive genetic variation of these species uh, to restore habitats and mitigate environmental change. And so just as genetics has been um, played a major role in agroecosystems and increasing food production, I would argue that genetics can play a major role in restoring and maintaining uh, so-called wild uh, ecosystems. And we just haven't tried it yet. And so I don't think a lot of ecologists really appreciate just how much genetic variation exists within a species and, and the traits that it actually affects. And so here's just a, a simple demonstration of this in a block design in a common garden. And here we have uh, four blocks and each block has replicate clones of the same tree genotype. So they've been cloned. And so all 16 members of this block have grown tremendously well. All 16 members of this block have died. And these two blocks show intermediate levels of performance. And so this is the kind of genetic variation that exists within a species. And you can use this to cope with pollution, uh, urbanization, climate change, all sorts of things uh, to conserve biodiversity and mitigate these effects. Okay, so I want to emphasize that uh, a large number of studies now really show this. Uh, and so here uh, is a series of about 35 papers that our group has published over the last six years where we've looked at the ecosystem services and cottonwoods, which are foundation species of riparian ecosystems. And what we've shown is that plant genetic factors account for about 45% of the variation in these ecosystem services. And so 
uh, a wide range of things from plant growth, trophic structure, nutrient cycles, soil feedbacks, uh, transgenic effects on community, community stability, below ground carbon storage, understory plant community composition and biomass, water cycles, and biodiversity. Big number here, 39 to 78 percent of the variation is genetically based. And so it doesn't matter whether you're looking at soil microorganisms, herbivores, birds, lichens, endophytes, pathogens, there's a huge genetic component to the genetic diversity here. And so what this emphasizes is the greater the genetic diversity in a foundation species is directly correlated with the biodiversity of the associated community. And we've now done various reviews of this. And basically, worldwide, we can show that in every system looked at so far within a genetics context, these sorts of patterns are emerging. And so we think there's a lot of generality to this. OK, so the next question I'd like to talk about is how do we use this genetics information um, to actually do restoration or ecosystem engineering? Well, there are three things I would talk briefly about today. The first one is different source populations and individual genotypes support different communities. So which genotypes and source populations we use in restoration will have a very important effect on the associated community. Okay, so here's a, a restoration project we became involved with the, with the Cibola National Wildlife Refuge collaboration with Reclamation and the National Science Foundation. And here are 17,000 trees just prior to being planted out into this field. And uh, 18 months later, uh, the average height was around 16 feet. And so each of these trees had been DNA fingerprinted. And so we were able to look at the communities associated as a, with these trees as a function of their individual genotypes and source populations. And in a survey of about 200 arthropod species, uh, Sharon Ferrier showed that different source populations support different communities. So this would represent the centroid, this is the confidence limit, and so different source populations are supporting different communities of organisms and these source populations of trees were collected throughout the state of Arizona. We had 16 different source populations. And so source population really matters because they're genetically different. And the other thing is from a single source population, the genotypes of the individual trees also matter. Okay, so this genotype supported a very different arthropod community than this genotype. And so again, greater genetic diversity in the foundation species, the greater the diversity in the dependent community. Okay, so the next point I'd like to briefly talk about is how restoration with intact sympatric communities will support the greatest productivity and biodiversity. So, here is this 17,000 tree experiment again, and I want to emphasize there were three species planted simultaneously, Fremont cottonwood, gooding willow, and coyote willow. They commonly occur with one another throughout the West. Each of these is a foundation species in its own right, and they interact with one another. Okay, so we had 16 source populations throughout, the South, throughout Arizona, where they co-occur. Then in those 16 source populations, we propagated them, and then we planted them in this garden sympatrically and allopatrically. So sympatrically would mean that from a single source population where we had all three species, we would plant them together in some blocks. And in other blocks, we would plant the same three species, but we would mix and match which source population they came from. So this represents sympatric populations and allopatric. Okay, so then we looked at the productivity of the foundation species, of, in this case, Fremont cottonwood, and you can see that the productivity when planted sympat when Fremont cottonwood was planted sympatrically with 
Gooding Willow and Coyote Willow. Its productivity was significantly greater across the board than it was when it was planted allopatrically. So this suggests that they have co-adapted when they live together. And so when you mix and match from different areas, you put them in compet greater competitive situations where the performance is reduced. Okay, so the effects not only uh, of the sympatric versus allopatric not only affect the productivity of these plants, it affects the associated arthropod community. And so this is some other work by Sharon with about 200 species of these insects showing that arthropod richness is significantly greater in sympatric plantings versus allopatric plantings. Okay, so genetics really matters here, and the genetic-based interactions of foundation species affect the dependent community. And so this argues that we really need, not when we're doing restoration, we need to think about not only the genetics of the foundation species, but we need to plant intact sympatric communities that have evolved together, presumably to minimize the negative effects upon each one another. The next point I briefly talk about is the gene, uh, is climate change. And the main point is that the genotypes for tomorrow's climate will likely be very different than those that do best today. So when we go out and do restoration and plant locally, which is the current mantra, we could be planting exactly the organisms that are, or genotypes that are doomed to die. And for the future, we need to be planting plants that will deal with tomorrow's climates more than today's climates. Okay, so here is a, a really, uh, I think, a, a very important way of scientifically addressing this question. And so here again, we have the same common garden that I showed you, and we have, again, 16 different source populations of Fremont cottonwood, and they come from, again, throughout the state of Arizona, some of them from high elevation, medium, and low elevation. And we planted them at a low elevation garden. Okay, so when I talk about transfer distance here, I don't mean kilometers. I'm talking about degrees uh, centigrade transfer distance. Okay, so when you take a high elevation uh, Fremont cottonwood and transfer it to a low elevation garden, the transfer distance can be as much as six and a half degrees centigrade. Okay, so when you do that, when you transfer this high elevation tree to a low elevation garden where here it would be zero, its productivity is about one third to one half of the productivity of a low elevation Fremont cottonwood planted at a low elevation garden whose productivity is much higher. Okay, so the slope of this is basically a quantitative measure of how locally adapted these populations are. And so if you have a steep slope, you have uh, very locally adapted organisms, and these are the ones you really need to focus on in terms of climate change. If the slope is slower, slope shallower or level, then you don't need to worry about it as much. And so this is a very quantitative way of prioritizing your efforts on which species you should really be worried about and how you should invest in dealing with climate change. Another thing that this graph I think is especially important that is that uh, each of these source populations has uh, error bars on it. And those error bars reflect the variation of individual genotypes in that source population. Okay, and so this is the potential for evolution to occur. And so once you exceed the variation in uh, clim climate changes and you exceed the variation of the local population, that local population is basically doomed. And to have that species still survive in that environment, you need to go to other populations that do have the genetic variation. Okay, so this gives you a uh, a real way of not only addressing the ability of local populations to evolve, but to actually then know where to go to find the genotypes that could survive in that environment with a three degree, four degree, five or six degree change in climate. So I think this is really uh, a very powerful approach 
to scientifically dealing with how do we deal with climate change and how do we use genetics to address uh, this problem. Uh, and again, in this slide, I'd like to talk about some of the work by Dana Akita in which she has modeled uh, different populations and how they would res might respond to climate change. And so here the emphasis is not modeling individual species, it's emphasizing modeling individual populations which incorporates a genetics perspective. And so when she modeled how the Mitri Lake source population would respond to climate change this century, this, the red indicates where its distribution would be at the end of the century. If she used the Sonoida Creek source population of Fremont Cottonwood, this is where its distribution would be predicted to be at the end of the century. Now I have a healthy skepticism of just what is the exact power of these models, not how accurate are they, but nevertheless, the same model was applied to both populations, and it indicates that different populations vary hugely in their responses to climate change. Again, arguing that we really need to take a genetics-based perspective. And it also argues that which population you might use in, in restoration could result in failure of the project or it could result in high success of the project. Okay, so what does all this sum up to? Well, I'd say our findings so far would argue that the most important thing to do is that we need to identify the foundation species of each ecosystem. In some cases it's pretty clear, and in other cases we really don't know how many foundation species are in each of the ecosystems that you work on. Uh, some are clear and some are not. Number two, we need to identify and prioritize the key genetic-based interactions of these foundation species. I haven't had a chance to talk about that, but that might be like understanding the interactions, say, between beavers and cottonwoods. They're uh, evolved in response to one another, and so we need to work on the, those interactions are incredibly important. Number three, we need to restore first with foundation species, and the community may come. And so when we go into an area and put in cottonwoods and willows, uh, the cottonwoods alone, within about three years, will bring in 700 species of insects. And so just dealing with one species allows us to pull in a much more complex community. Uh, and the main method that I think that is a way to deal with this is what I call a community provenance trial. And a community provenance trial is an extension of the Forest Service uh, provenance trial that just looked at one species at a time. I think we need to have provenance trials in which we do all the foundation species simultaneously as they would naturally occur in nature. Um, I would like to emphasize that uh, all the work I've talked about uh, is a collaboration of many individuals, uh, graduate students, postdocs, uh, and colleagues from uh, Northern Arizona University and around the country and the world. And uh, they've added a, a, a tremendous uh, breadth to this from genes to ecosystems and microbes to vertebrates. And I'd like to put in a, a plug. Uh, we just finished a PBS uh, a documentary film on a genes to uh, ecosystem approach. And the title of this documentary, which should start coming out on PBS stations, uh, is A Thousand Invisible Chords. And uh, this title is derived from a famous quote by John Muir on a thousand invisible chords, the connections between species. But it also relates to Charles Darwin's famous quote uh, on the Tangled Bank. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>